am in love with Montana. Shout out to the Montanians. You guys have an incredible outdoor state. I'm watching a daggum chucker fly across the field right now. Beautiful sunrise. Had a little rain here last night. And today's video is going to be about the breakdown of the animal. So last video, you guys got to see the hunt. That was amazing. Uh, just awesome time up here. Uh, today, this is a really important part. Here at this filled to table event, this is a, a this is a few days. This is actually three or four days long. And we're going out and we're hunting. Then we're going to the skinning rack to break down, quarter the animal, you know, take the hide off and all that. And then it's uh, preserving, vacuum sealing, and then going to the actual kitchen and learning recipes and uh, different ways to cook the meats, you know, because some are some parts are more tender, some parts are uh, more tough. The parts you want to eat like right away that are better some you don't want to let sit and age a while because though they might get rancid there's a lot to learn and i'm excited to uh to gain some new knowledge up here and, and pass it along to you guys so if you are looking for a little refresher course maybe you're getting ready to hit the deer stand this would be a good video to watch because we're going to see uh how a professional chef likes to break down a deer and then take it to the kitchen so let's head to the skinning rack so there's a big important step here that we're skipping over and that is the field dressing. And because that's such a messy and visceral process, I don't think we're gonna be allowed to show it here. But I do just wanna add a couple of notes I learned on this trip from field dressing. Number one, you're gonna start with that rear cavity and you wanna go ahead and ream that out. But then your next step, when you're cutting into the skin of the belly and going around the groin area, don't cut too deep. The reason is that same knife that you're using to ream out that rear pipe, you're gonna be cutting into those delicious, tender cuts of meat that you don't want to taint with any bacteria. Number two, leave as much hide on the legs as possible. It's an added layer of protection when you're dragging that animal through the brush and the fields and into a back of a truck that might be around some other animals. It keeps an extra layer of protection around your meat. And number three, always anticipate the harvest of the animal. That means carrying you a proper cleaning kit in your pack or your truck. That way you're never caught off guard when you have an animal on the ground. And now that we have it field dressed, we're going to the skinning rack, but the next step is going to be to skin the hawks down. There's a tendon around that rear hawk that you're gonna hang your animal from. This can be done with a metal gambrel or a stick or a hook but it's gonna be a lot easier if you already have the skin peeled down from there. I've made this mistake plenty of times at the skinning rack and it'll save you about 20 minutes of trying to do surgery around that hawk. The next step after you hang your animal up is to remove that front lower leg. This can be done by simply taking your knife and going around the joint and then simply twisting the leg until it cracks and then cutting the excess skin off. You can use a saw, but in my opinion, it's extra work and you might be getting something into your meat that you don't want to if your saw isn't clean. The skinning process can be done a lot of different ways and there's many different techniques out there. As the old saying goes, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. But the important part is you're removing the hide off the animal, trying not to contaminate the meat with any hair or other debris, and then not using any water. Yes, you heard me right, and I have sprayed down dozens of deer. But splashing water on the carcass can spread contaminants, and a lot of times the water hose that's next to the skinning rack isn't exactly the best water. So if you do a halfway good job in the field dressing, and you're taking your time doing a good job with the skinning and removing the hide, you actually don't need any water. Another important aspect of taking the hide off is revealing any bloodshot or any other wounds that might occur underneath the skin. This is especially important if you're going to age your meat. It could be a cactus thorn that's causing an infection. It could be a bullet wound. It could be a part of someone else's arrow. You just never know until you pull that skin off. Any part that is excessively bloody, gelatinous, or has an infection, you'll want to cut out right away. This is Chef Albert and he is a venison wizard. And he's going to be our guide in butchering, processing, and the chefing part of this whole thing, the really exciting part. 
So I just want to give you guys a quick tip. Just take it off a leg. So this, we got the hide off because if you hung this for five days, you know, in cool weather, that all that's going to ruin everything below because right. all that blood's going to permeate. This is the exit the wound where we've got a little bit of gel gelatinous stuff. So below. that's why we want to get that hide off. And then what we want to do is just follow the seam and we're going to take the leg off with the least amount of meat on the leg. We're going to leave all the meat on the carcass and then come back and peel out. Because this is that beautiful brisket. See the brisket yes, right sir. there? Yes, sir. So we'll okay. come down later and peel all that off. So stay close and Stay on the close inside. and follow that seam. See okay. the seam right yep. there? Seam, right. And the big thing is to move that leg around with your Pull hand. it. Yeah, so you can feel, feel it. as you cut through there. Okay. Okay, so. All right, yeah, we're so, staying close. Yep. We're, this so is the seam you here. You got it. You got it. All right, and then we're just gonna just cut, come up. Now on this, right? If you lift that leg up and out, you can see the seam better in there because the blade is gonna go all the way to the top of the back okay. up here. Scoot back. This right here is the prime rib on the rack of lamb. Okay. So right. we don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to mess that. Yeah. Up. So okay. As you do this, stay tight. So you see how you move it around? You can feel it. You can keep opening it up. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. That that exposes it. Okay. Yep. So he's an executive chef, but he's also a big time hunter and he loves to hunt for elk and other wild game. And he's, he's mastered the art of turning these wild animals into delicious five star meals. And he's written numerous books about it and does a lot of educating. He's a great teacher on this subject. So uh, it was a great guy to listen to, and I just couldn't get enough of uh, his his knowledge on how to cook wild game and fish and everything else. All right. So that right there is the prime rib right there. Oh, yeah. So and I, I honestly, I've taken that off, off that. a lot of times. So I'm sure why, a lot of people have. Yeah, so that's why we don't want to cut into that okay. piece right there. All right, so really pull on that leg over. Yeah, so then you can, you can feel it and... And that again, see, that's why we got to get into there so that that doesn't, that blood doesn't stay in there because the blood ruins the meat. Gotcha. Okay, I'm just gonna cut right on top of that blade. Albert coming in with the instruction clutch. These, these bones right here are called the finger bones. So we're gonna come. This is part of the. It's called the H bone. It's part of the pelvic bone. Okay. We just come in, go right below that, and right to. These feather yeah, bones that like, stick up. Uh, yep. So we just come right below there, right yeah. to those. Yep. Then we come behind yep. these yep. finger bones, yeah. so, straight yeah, in. So we're start that for next year. We don't go this way because you put a big slit in the premium cut because this is the New York strip and the prime rib. Uh -huh. So we go straight in. Okay. And on antelope and pigs, there's a little ridge along the spine. So we just cut like that, and come in. And then come in straight line down. Come straight down. Yes. Oh man, that is beautiful. Look at that beautiful antelope meat. Boy, that's a nice one. Oh, guys. I love I love so that you're showing all the muscle groups and everything. So then this, this is the eye. This gets big here and gets smaller. Right. And then this one gets starts small and gets bigger. So this would work up to the hump on the back of a bison or the big shoulder of an elk. So this gets bigger and gets tougher. This gets tender and gets smaller. So later we'll separate these. So after removing the back straps, the tenderloins, and the front quarters, we removed the neck and shoulder meat all at once, then separated the back quarters and put it on ice. There's a lot of nuance and we could spend an hour on butchering alone. So as a suggestion, Outdoor Solutions has a website. They have a YouTube channel. Chef Albert goes through a lot of these cuts individually on the butchering. And I'll link that below so you guys can reference it, bookmark it, and when you're going to break down your deer this season, you want a refresher, you can refer back to that. So our antelope has been sitting on ice overnight. It's nice and chilled now. 
and we will start to break down the process. So let's go. And now I'm just gonna get out of the way and let Chef Albert yeah. preach. They're worked more, they have more connective tissue, so they have more flavor. Literally, you mean on the forelegs? Yeah, on the front okay. and hind legs. On both? Yep. Yeah. Okay. On, on. So I, I have a basic thing, the closer to the ground, the more flavor there is. Okay. So if you look at a domestic turkey, you have legs and thighs are dark meat. They have more flavor sure. than the breast. They're worked more, so they have a different oxygen content, so that's why they're dark. A bird of flight is all dark meat because it, it's all worked. This is that most tender cut, and if you try to age the animal when you leave this in there, this is gonna dry up and you're not gonna get a good yield out of it. So this really doesn't need to age. So I, t I take it out for multiple reasons. One, I take it out because it doesn't need to age. Two, where I hunt, I always gotta go get pack frames. And when I come back, the magpies and camp robbers ate this because they know where this is this is the most they they it, it's gone literally the there's just some no, connective that's tissue it. that's left so this one is a little a little beat up but basically we just take our knife and we can take this and then kind of skin this if you wanted to you i mean sometimes you don't even have to do that and you can just peel that off that piece of connective tissue. That's what the magpies leave. Okay. But you, you just throw that over there, clean a little of this bloodshot off. And the other thing that you want to be careful about when you feel dress the animal is that you don't want to open up the bladder or that anal tract and get smart pills on this. Because I've seen people hang the deer and they got the whole anal tract still in the pelvic bone and all of that you know there's smart pills stuck to the tenderloin and uh you know uh, you don't you don't want that kind of contamination on this nice tender cut of meat this <laughs> fascia this tacky membrane that's what makes the meat taste gamey and that's on every muscle that makes it taste gamey that's what makes it contort out of shape and that's what makes it chewy so any muscle that you're using like for dry cooking methods where you're using tender cuts, that really should come off. Even I'll take it off on, uh, you know, Sandhill crane breasts or turkey breasts. Uh, if in a commercial kitchen, when we buy venison at 20 some bucks a pound, that has to come off if you're gonna dry cook it. I don't recommend that you eat ever even cook anything in the first 24 hours. Let the muscles rest. So the most important thing I think on Anything after the field care is to, you've got to let the muscles rest for 24 hours. If I take this loin right here and I peel it off, the whole carcass, that's one thing. But if I start cutting this into little pieces and before the muscles have relaxed, then I'm making the meat chewier. We saw that bloodshot and the hides there, and all that bloodshot is permeating the other muscles and that will sour fast, so now it's ruining our meat. So we take the hide off, get the body temperature down, and then we dry age it by hanging it, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in, a, in a cooler or some, in a refrigerator or whatever, and you get that skin formation on there. At five to seven days, right around 40 degrees is a That's good the, I was gonna ask good. what the best is. So Cause after seven days, it slows way down. And then as again, we start getting a lot of evaporation out of it. So we start losing. But if we don't have the right conditions, don't worry about it. Just cut it up and you know go from there. But the most important thing is letting that rest in the first 24 hours. Okay. I cooked for some celebrity hunters once in Texas, and I said, "Well, I want a deer hanging before I get there." And you know, I got there at two o'clock. They shot the deer at 1:30, and they ate it at six o'clock that night. And when Tough. I put it in the pan, it took off running. <laughs> <laughs> it was, oh yeah, you could just see the muscle go. I mean, it was literally twitching in the pan. You know, uh, and it, it was chewy. So a wet age would be to take and cut the muscles and then vacuum seal it and le let it wet age in the refrigerator for three weeks. And that's until you want to eat it? Or you said three weeks? Uh, to if you want to eat it or freeze it at that time. Okay, three weeks it's pretty much ready. Together. Oh yeah, you can you can age it for a week or three weeks. It, it, you know, it, it's up to the individual. I, my objective is for, for you to be able to cut your deer up in a half an hour. Okay. You should be able to cut your deer up in a half an hour, but 
I don't cut it into steaks and chops and stew meat. I cut it into muscles and then I can do whatever I want with those muscles when it comes out. So I'll, I'll yeah. talk about that one cool. as we do this. Oh. So this is your, that is silver skin. Yes. So that is different than that tacky fascia, but that right. also has to be removed because that is what makes it chewy and you can't break that down. And then this, you know, this is your along the back because this runs from the back of the head all the way to the tail, this big sinew. So this piece of meat then, again, if you take this off before it hangs for a long period of time, this is usable. But if this hangs for a while, then this dries up and you don't get much off of there. So this is one way that you can just kind of like almost skin it like a fish. Okay, and then that, that goes into a, a scrap pile for... Yeah, so whatever. then this can be used for grinding, grinding and or... Sausage stuff. Sausage. You can see this where these muscles are coming apart. I'm going to use my hand just to show you. So you can see this oh, yeah. piece. The seam. So then we just tell, I'm just gonna cut this piece off. And now we have another good usable piece of meat that could be used for stew. And uh, you can see the, the skin on there. So again, I just start it. Now, another way is to, to you can Push skin it like a fish or just do this. And while it's pretty fresh, it'll come out there yeah. easily. So this, that that's your silver skin. This is connective tissue and this is fresh and it's clean. So this, if you want, if you make stock or bone broth, take a bag and make a pile of this and throw it in the, in the freezer. With the meat on it, not yeah, just the Just like this. Tissue. And then when you brown your bones to make stock, brown this. This is full of connective tissue, full of collagen. So people take collagen supplements. Mm -hmm. that, so when you cool your stock, it's gonna set up like jello from that collagen. Personally, what I do with this is I just take this and, and go like this. Okay, I'm right so far. Yeah, that's that's good stew. Yeah. And I, so, and into the freezer goes. So oh, okay. just, just so you don't send it right down. I don't yeah. take that off. Really? You take that when you thaw it? I take it when I thaw it. Oh, so okay. right. go three quarters of the way through and open it up. And then I can make what we call a medallion. So this is, so that's, that would be a butterfly chop. This would be a butterfly medallion. Or I can cut three quarters of the way through, all the way through, and then hit it, say, with a, with a, well, your hand, and make this thinner, and take this turkey breast, and now I have a cutlet, so I can go flour, egg wash, cornflake crumbs, and make the best Wiener schnitzel that you ever had out of this. I can take this and put some prosciutto and some sage and some roasted garlic, basil, uh, you know, fontina cheese or anything, close it up and make venison, salt, and bokeh out of it. So I can do uh, anything with that duck breast or that. So that's, a, so that's a chop, that's a medallion, that's a cutlet, and then I can just cut strips, especially if, again, if it has some frost in it. Now I can make sauteed uh, stroganoff, or Thai uh, turkey, you know, like a Thai curry out of the turkey. So I, I call those strips stir fry, stroganoff, mm -hmm. and so, things like that. So let's go back. So this is a tender cut. So then we have a muscle right here. This is called the football or the knuckle or the sirloin tip. This muscle is less tender. And then we have the shank down here. This is tough. So we kind of classify it into three different tendernesses. So we got tender, less tender, and tough. Tender cuts from a professional chef's point of view are all cooked with dry cooking methods, which dry cooking methods are stir fry, saute, pan fry, deep fry, broil, grill, and roast. High heat, fast, and always served rare. With the exception of, say, boar and bear, they should be cooked well done. Now, well done means to still have moisture, not dried out to nothing. But they should be cooked well done. But What's everything else are? is rare. The tough cuts, we have to basically cook the hell out of them to make them tender. 
So if you see a chef taking a thermometer and sticking it into like Osabuco or Bray's shanks, the chef's gonna, you know, pop you on the back of the head. It's like, what are you taking this thermometer for? It's cooked well done, fork tender. It, you know, it's gonna be well done. You don't need to take a temperature on it. You know, by, you know, it's always gonna be well done because you have to cook the heck out of it to make it tender. And then the in-between cuts, like the bottom round and the sirloin tip, then those can be cooked either way. They can be braised and or stewed or uh, in a pressure cooker, or they can be cooked with dry cooking methods. So I'm not gonna cover this and smother this in sauce because the object is to have that flavor and that presentation. Or I'm gonna do it in a cast iron pan because I want it seared and then I'm gonna top it with some you know, liver mousse and then top it with some, you know, uh, truffle oil or whatever and, you know, make it fancy. So that would be the presentation of this. This, I'm going to saute. So saute means it's going to be smothered in sauce. You don't just pan sear it and serve it. When it's ever a saute dish, you, the object of saute is to make the sauce in the pan from the brown stuff on the bottom of the pan. On here, if I'm gonna stir fry, I can cut it in little strips, or I can cut it in wider strips, make and chip it into even pieces this big, and saute it really fast, or sear it, stir fry it really fast. So it's all about like, well, what's the finished product gonna look like? That determines how I'm gonna cut it. And this gentleman right here is Chef Joe. And Joe has become one of my new role models. Not only does Joe hunt for most of his meat, he is also a fishing freak. He knows how to cook a fish three ways to Sunday. You would not want to have a cook-off with this man. He even built his own butchering station inside of his workshop at home. This guy is just a legend. In the center of this, and then stuff it with those tails. Or I, I really like to use tiger prawns and stuff that, and then um, give it a quick sear, and then either put it on the grill and cook it for another... 10 minutes just so everything's done or put it in the oven and, and give it a quick you know roast it and bring it back out and then when you slice that um, you have just your surf and turf uh, how, did, how did you say you got the uh, prawns in there you, you so cut what, it in no, half what I do and is, fold it um, I come in and I just insert the knife okay yeah and then I make a pocket Okay. Create a pocket oh, and then you right, just stuff right. them in there and then the other one is you take a little fillet like this just lay that prawn and roll it roll up it, yeah. toothpick it and grill it okay. and, and you've got a nice appetizer that way with a little uh, salsa verde or something on the side so it's just different ways and different things to think about we're going next level master class here <laughs> this is amazing i love that every every story that he talked about of basically messing up the meat I've pretty much done. I've done all the things. I'm sure most of us have, where we have uh, contaminated the meat, gotten it dirty, let it age too long, not enough. I've done it all, guys. I've made all the mistakes. It's good to learn exactly what to do here and uh, have somebody that's really open and honest about it and uh, has learned and learned from hunters all over the world and chefs from all over the world. And so we're talking about making some dishes that are life pleasers. Uh, we're gonna go inside, learn a bit, a little bit more. Hope you guys are learning a lot so far. I certainly am. Uh, I'd love to bring Stephanie to one of these and have her learn all this stuff too. It's, it's good for anybody that, that loves to cook wild game. All right, guys, learn some things with the knife work from uh, from Chef Albert, and we got a nice, clean-looking bucket here of our meat. So let me show you what we got going on. You know, he preferred on the back straps. Go ahead, leave that silver skin on. You can take it off later. It's actually easier uh, after it's been uh, frozen or, or, or uh, in the refrigerator or frozen for a while. It becomes more rigid, just easier. So when you go to prepare this for the grill. You can take that off then you don't have to mess with it uh, he also showed us how to do uh, medallions how to do um, like little stir fry bits these little steaks right here that was that was really cool to learn that technique um, the tendies you know i've always messed the tendies up and the back straps quite frankly because i have i have left the other pieces of meat so he he showed us the different muscle groups how to get your fingers in there get in the seams 
pull those apart where you're getting the actual back strap. And then the other stuff, you can kind of take your knife and turn it uh, flat instead of really cutting into it and push. You can push a lot of this meat off the tendons and these connective tissues instead of sitting there and trying to slice it. It just made it a lot faster. So I've got a scrap, scrap pile in here. Um, some of this sinew will actually uh, cook down uh, add some flavor and, and that's okay to have a little bit in there. Um, that's something that's taken me a, a ton of time in the past, but you want to make sure you get the, uh, any like any wounded spots, like uh, bloody spots and this, this stuff right here, the stuff that bubbles up this little skin, this is what gives it the gamey flavor right here. So you want to try to get as much of that off there as possible. Uh, and on the tendies, take the little strip off. Um, there's a little little strip. You just basically pull that off with your fingers. It's so tender. And then cut off the ends and just clean them up of that little uh, the little snotty stuff, and you're good to go. And those are the best looking tendies I've ever produced. Um, I gotta say, this definitely feels more tender than whitetail. Moving on to breaking down the quarters. Before you get started breaking down the leg, you want to take all the sinew, that's that white kind of clear stuff, you want to take that layer, that cap off, and then also any fascia that might be included. That's that bubbly, slimy stuff again. And then from there, there's a lot of different ways you could break down the legs, but the main thing is you just want to get your fingers in between those seams, start separating the muscle groups, and then just use your knife to separate the connective tissues. Right there. Nice and uh, that's a tender cut. Then this one right here, so this is the outside of the leg. This is the outside or bottom round. So you can tell by the grain of it and the size of it. So this is right here along the seam, outside bottom round. That's Good less tender. Less tender. It's not less tender. It's yeah. It's less tender. Tender. Less tender. So less tender. Then this one here is the sirloin tip or knuckle, or I call it the football because it looks like a football. Mm -hmm. This is less tender too. This, anybody from California? So well, this is the tri-tip right tri -tip, here. Tri-tip, yeah. So on a beef, that's big. On a little antelope, it's just good yeah. stew meat. This right here is the eye of the round right here. And, and then this, so the, you'll see beef, you know, eye of the round and the meat counter. And then this, is the inside top round, it's heart shaped. This is the most tender cut on the hind leg. Wow. So when I'm buying top rounds of veal for veal scallopini, that's the muscle I'm buying. So here you can go right down, right back to, there's your uh, tri-tip, here's the butt. So we can just follow this right down. So like I said earlier, if the animal is hanging, you can peel this off the, the animal, animal hanging. Or if you wanted to vent it so you could want to cool it down. You just open up these gaps between these muscles. Right, right. And let it right. sit there and hang like that. Exactly. More air you can open there. that up like this and just let it hang there. Okay. Now, in what when you get into these rounds, you'll know you're between the bottom and the top by the, in the eye, by this wad of fat in there. So remember when I said we don't cut round steaks out of venison? Number one, they're usually older. Number two, all, look what's inside that round steak. All these muscles mm -hmm. are covered with fascia. Mm -hmm. And all of this is on the inside of those round steaks. So that's why the gamey, the meat tastes gamey and that's why family members don't want to eat gamey because they say, oh, it tastes too gamey. There's the shank. Here's what we call the heel, which is part of that. So this is when you order lamb shanks with the bone in, that's that's what you're getting at the restaurant. And if you get order osabuco, that's what you're getting, those thick cuts off the veal or the elk or whatever. This piece is the bottom outside round, and this piece is the eye of the round. There's a gland in this big wad of fat. Yeah and lamb, that's called a stink yeah. gland. Yeah. So, you know, you can literally, I mean, take these apart with your, with your hand. So this is the bottom round, that's the eye of the round. Again, shank and heel. 
So if I want to just peel this off, I just come right down, file this down. There's lots of ways to do this, but I'm just gonna cut this. So if I wanted to take this muscle or this, you know, I could take this apart and leave the, you could saw this, but or you could just leave it on there and you can cut this, you know, with the bone in and make a, you know, a shank right there. So what does that look like right there? Does that look like the, the, the drumstick of a it's turkey or yeah. a grease? Yeah. King so Art. this King cooks King. the same exact way. So when you're in Disney World and those people are eating those smoked drumsticks like lollipops, that's what you got right there. So that's like a 36 hour slow cook. Yeah. They are smoked. Yeah. They do yeah. call it a lollipop steak. You can run it through a cuber, you can cut it thin, you know, you could still get away with dry cooking methods with these. If you, if I was gonna can it in jars, these would be the premium cuts for me to put in a canner. And on an elk, this muscle is eight pounds and you can peel it apart in three pieces so they look like this. So when it's all said and done, you should have something that looks like this on your cutting table with that rear leg. I think it's important to remember all the names and label them on your packaging. But even more important, just remember these shapes and remember the toughnesses of the cuts. This guy right here, his name is Greg. He's the founder of Outdoor Solutions and 10 years ago, Greg didn't know the difference between all these muscle cuts either. So he decided to start a class to teach people about it. I promise he does more than just label plastic bags with meat groups. Chamber backed sirloin tip. It's about to be a party in here. Sausage party. Yes, y'all, this is such an important skill to know how to make a sausage. I was especially excited about this because I finally got my own meat grinder now. I have meat in the freezer and now I can make my own sausage. I have learned the secrets of sausage making. And this was actually more simple than I thought, but it's the little details that count. Number one, you gotta keep that meat cold, dang near frozen. And this is gonna help in the blending process. The ratio we used was four to one. Taking all that excess meat from the quartering, putting it in that scrap pile, four pounds of that and one pound of fat, or in this case, we use bacon. We ran it through the grinder twice and then it was on to mixing. The mixing part didn't seem important to me at first, but what I learned is that churning the meat together will actually create a tackiness and that tackiness is what you want. Here's where we added our seasonings and fresh herbs to make the best fresh sausage I've ever had. We even learned how to take real pig intestines and squeeze them into hot links. Now to cap this week off, what we're gonna do is create a meal designed by Chef Albert using all the knowledge we've obtained in the last 48 hours to please a room full of people. Me and my hunting partner, we were assigned with a merguez sausage with a dirty rice gumbo. So, come on, let's go in and I'll show you where you're gonna work. Final test. This is what you've all been waiting for. The chef has given us instructions. It's time to make it happen. Real dinner, five course meal, starting with me and Scott first. A little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. It's al dente, it's nice and crunchy. Uh, but in another five minutes, it will be ready to go. Because okay. what that happens when usually that will prevent that from making the gumbo kind of stupid. The big moment is here. 10 minutes left. We're first up. We're the first dishes out. We're going to be presenting our meal. So, hope everyone likes it. And we come in here and we got our nice dirty rice. That can go over there, please. We're going to put the rice on this side of it. And so we got some chives on the rice. We have some okra. Okay, here our first course. You did a great job, especially these two guys, but the entire team. You really pulled it off. Nice. Yeah. Really. 
This is what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. The final product, literally field to table within days. And this merguez sausage in a dirty rice gumbo, it's amazing. My partner, Scott, we made everything from scratch with uh, Albert's help. Never made a roux before. Uh, never made sausage before. We literally made the sausage out of the antelope. We added my antelope heart into this for the dirty rice. Knowing how to blend the ingredients, mix everything together to get a, a just nice balanced flavor. This is one of the best gumbos I've ever had, but it's even more special because it's an animal that I, that I harvested. Four more courses that they're gonna bring out, different meat tenders, uh, tendernesses of the meat. So this one is gonna be like a, a semi tender and we're gonna finish with a full tender cut. With all these different uh, spices that I never even used before, guys. I've learned so much on the cooking side here at this thing, it's insane. So I can't wait to bring this knowledge home. But I gotta log off right here, get back to the kitchen. This is actually uh, pretty cool because I get to see how a professional kitchen works too with a team of people. Uh, we had a deadline, a time, we had to present our meal to everybody. So it was pretty exciting stuff. Felt like I was in the, the cooking industry there for a minute. But thank you guys for tuning in to these videos. I think this is the most important part of, of harvesting, of, of hunting and fishing, whatever you're doing is this right here. It's sitting down with um, friends and family, serving the meal and just taking a lot of pride in it. This increasingly is just becoming such a uh, obsession of mine is taking whatever animal I'm taking out of the lake or the woods, doing a great job with uh, the harvest, the processing, and then putting it on the table where everyone enjoys it. I just love it, guys. So thank you for tuning in. I, I'm sure you have learned something in this video, so smash the like button. Uh, if you want to be a part of one of these courses too, uh, you can you can visit their website, again, it's a field to table event. It's put on by Outdoor Solutions. They do a lot of them a year. It's growing in popularity because everyone is starting to realize we don't really know where our food is coming from at the grocery store. So it's nice to actually harvest your own food and prepare it like something you would have in a restaurant. Be really proud of it. So awesome event. I would recommend this to anybody. I will see you guys back in Texas for another fishing, hunting, or outdoor adventure or treehouse vlog. Uh, and thank you guys again for being here. I'm gonna take one more bite and get back in with the, with the crew and chat it up. But enjoyed the heck of being up here in Montana for the first time. Awesome experience.